So folks, it was yet another night where Donald Trump makes it clear why he needed to have the gag order on him and why reasonable people like you and me and everybody else see him for the dangerous threat that he is. And Donald Trump is trying to delete this video. I've been getting emails from people in Trump world uh, trying to get this taken down, right? So I need your help to save this channel and our movement. I need you to hit that like and subscribe button. I also need you to click the videos as soon as they go up because that's how we make them go viral to stop Donald Trump. And guys, what I have for you in this at first is a couple legal experts pointing out what Donald Trump has done just today, including at this rally, to justify any of the moves the judge has made against him regarding a gag order. Like if you ever feel he doesn't need one, well, then you just have to wait five minutes and see what he does. And then it's damn well justified. But also we get to see what he did in front of his crowd, a largely empty, tiny crowd but rabid nonetheless in a sense, but he gets into a confrontation with protesters and it gets very ugly and very violent, especially given the context of the judge and the tied up Biden thing and the judge's daughter. Watch all of this. The last 45 seconds are essential. Do not let Trump take us down. Watch every video on this channel, guys, and we will defeat the Donald. Tonight, Donald Trump practically daring the court to find him in violation of his gag order in the Stormy Daniels hush money case. Trump posting a clip from Fox News that criticizes the daughter of Judge Merchant. Just hours after the gag order was expanded to specifically prohibit Trump from attacking the judge's family. Trump's post quoting law professor Jonathan Turley saying, quote, the integrity of the New York legal system is at stake here. The clip also included these comments from Fox News's Brian Kilmeade. The fact is, the judge's daughter what is a activist who works for uh, Kamala Harris, and there was some, some dispute on whether she did have a picture up on a website with J Donald Trump behind bars. That, to me, is something that, you, if I'm Donald Trump, I'm a little concerned about that the judge has a daughter who feels this way. All right, so it's important just to have one factual clarification here. Uh, the judge's daughter posting a photo of Trump behind bars. Uh, that has been debunked, did not happen. Um, Ryan, uh, Ryan Goodman, our out front legal analyst, is with me. So, Ryan, um, so Trump gets the gag order, prohibited from attacking family members of Judge Merchant, and then retweets this, this particular clip. Does this violate the gag order, or is Trump safe because it's not him saying it, it's someone else? I think it violates the gag order. So if the very words out of Brian Kilmeade's mouth came out of Trump's mouth or out of his keyboard, if he typed those words, they would be in violation of the gag order. That is the smear that's being repeated against the judge's daughter. The fact that Trump is instead posting a video of somebody else saying it runs afoul of the gag order. That is him still making a statement. And I think that uh, the judge will have to carefully look at this because if he gives it a pass, then he really is giving a pass to a violation. But then what happens if he says it's a violation? I think that it's going to be a quick ratcheting up. Uh, the judge has already signaled that he has an intolerance for violations of his orders. And I think first step might be something that's financial. Second step might be financial. And I think third is actually potentially lowering the boom, which is he will treat Trump as he would treat any defendant. And that would mean jail time if he violates a gag order multiple times. And so we're walking up to that line. It, it really looks like it. Wow. So um, in, in Manhattan, the district attorney, Alvin Bragg, is uh, also fighting back. So he is rejecting a bid by Trump to have Judge Merchant recuse himself, um, you know, citing uh, his daughter's political work of working for Kamala Harris. Donald Trump spent the past week attacking the daughter of the judge in his New York hush money trial. It started after an initial gag order was imposed, barring Trump from commenting publicly about lawyers, witnesses, court staff, and jurors in the trial now scheduled to start April 15th. But in the days that followed, Trump attacked the judge's daughter at least four times on his Truth Social platform, posting her name, also posting a news story with photos of her. And he basically painted a target on this young woman's back, so much so the judge had to adjust the order to cover his own family members. And family members of the district attorney writing, quote, this pattern of attacking family members of presiding jurists and attorneys assigned to his cases serves no legitimate purpose. It merely injects fear in those assigned or called to participate in the proceedings. Not, not only they, but their family members as well are fair game for defendants' vitriol. Yesterday, the judge expanded the gag order on Trump. Since then, Trump has still been attacking the judge, but notably he has stopped just short of attacking the judge's daughter. 
Joining me now is MSNBC legal correspondent Lisa Rubin. And first, I just want to start with this, that you, every time we do one of these, you can sort of lose sight of how just completely out of unprecedented it is, how, how different it is. It just does not happen. It doesn't happen in courtrooms. It doesn't happen with defendants. We're just in a totally different universe in which this man with a lot of power and a lot of followers is berating the judge's daughter. Yeah, and every time you and I get together or I show up on other shows talking about the extraordinariness of the moment, that in and of itself becomes ordinary for viewers who then grow inoculated to this kind of behavior that is so far beyond the pale of what's acceptable in most courtrooms in the United States that we forget. Or even what would be attempted. Like, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, not even, like, yes, it's unacceptable, but even just like in a universe in which there are millions of criminal defendants, like this just doesn't really happen. No, it doesn't, because most criminal defendants would face consequences far sooner than Donald Trump has. So there have been some consequences, at least the judge order, the, the gag order has been expanded. That's right. And uh, again, we've seen this, we saw this in the past with Angora, and we've seen it in other places where he does know what he's doing. And That's so he stops right. just short. Yeah, he stops just short. So what does he do now? He reposts other people's statements about the daughter in order to skirt the prohibition, which is framed as he can't make or direct others to make public statements about certain folks. He's not making a statement. He's not directing others to make a statement. He's merely republishing a statement, but that has the exact same thrust and gist to the things that he was saying before. Um, there's also now uh, the, the, a, a, a request for recusal, which strikes me as, um, uh, you know, a, I don't know, a, a a, a not serious motion. I don't know it's, what the... It's worse than that because it's the tail wagging the dog. You know, one of the things I noticed in the opposition that they wrote to the gag order just a couple of hours before Judge Mershon issued that gag order is they said all Trump was doing here was trying to amplify defense arguments about Mershon. So in his post about Mershon's daughter last week, they claimed that really what that was about was just trying to help his lawyers communicate to people how necessary recusal was. I don't want to rehash exactly what he posted, but that was not the aim. But here, what they're trying to do is conflate the political and the legal so that it all collapses into one and take what would be opposition research in an ordinary political campaign and sort of migrated into this case and the Trojan horse of a recusal motion. Right. So I guess the question is like, you know, there, there's always been this the, the sort of there's these two universes, right? Like we saw this in the litigation after uh, the election 2020, which is they can make all the wild claims they want to and be hosted by Republican lawmakers and say all sorts of crazy stuff. As soon as those claims enter a courthouse, they got reduced to rubble. In their hats on, that is immigration. Voters tend to give the GOP higher marks on the issue, and this time that is being supercharged potentially by the number of migrants that have arrived in cities far from the border, blue cities. According to polling done by the AP, about two-thirds of Americans do not approve of Biden's handling of the border, including four in ten Democrats. Joining us now in Green Bay with the Trump campaign, our NBC News correspondent Von Hilliard. Also with me is the Cook Political Report senior editor David Wasserman. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Vaughn, I'm going to start with you. So this is such a, a thorny issue because the Biden administration, when they're talking about immigration, will say, hey, listen, we came to a compromise in the Senate, a conservative leaning compromise on the issue of immigration. And it wasn't Democrats who were shooting it down. It was Republicans who shot it down, Republicans in the Senate, Republicans in the House at the request of Donald Trump. So how is Donald Trump then trying to take that issue, which he torpedoed, a compromise, which he torpedoed, and, and try to run on it, try to campaign on it? Well, I think that that's what we're about to watch, Katie. You're the one that just said it. He urged his Republican colleagues in the United States Congress to kill the bill, and they effectively did. And now, for the next seven months, he, as we are witnessing at this very moment, I was just listening to him giving these remarks in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and using anecdotally uh, the lives of individuals, Americans who were killed at the hands of undocumented immigrants as emotional motivation to have the American electorate rally around Republicans, including him, uh, come November. And yet what we have seen is that this is a playbook that we have seen from Donald Trump before. The question is, will it work this go around? Katie, in July of 2015, you and I were in Phoenix, Arizona, his first mega rally. And one of the pre-speakers at that event in July of 2015 
was the father of an individual who was killed by an undocumented immigrant. Donald Trump has used these anecdotal stories to try to motivate the base and support to rally around him. I can even go back to a past job of mine. Back in 2010, Steve King, the former congressman from Iowa, had made a claim that 9,000 Americans were killed annually by undocumented immigrants. This is something that Americans have heard, this sort of, sort of severe immigration rhetoric for a long time. But frankly, the data does not bear out the fact that undocumented immigrants kill Americans at any greater rate than uh, uh, legal Americans, if you will. But that is the difficult part here, and especially when you're dealing with devastating, tragic stories like uh, Lake and Riley's in Georgia. And Donald Trump has made it clear that he is going to try to politically use yeah. those tragedies for the political game. Well, the dad you know, we won this state. We won this state by a lot. And it came out that we won this state, actually. You know, when you have open borders, think of it. That's all right. There's one guy. Now, here's what the fake news will do. There was tremendous dissension tonight. It was there. One guy going home to mom. He's going to get the hell beat out of him by his mother. Mom's going to say, what the hell are you doing? You embarrassed me. You embarrassed me. No, the, the papers, the fake news will say it was tremendous dissension. Tremendous. Yeah, one guy. And he's now scared stiff because he's got to go home to his mother. The mother will say, we, I saw you in television. You embarrassed me. Beep, beep. <laughs> With your support, we're going to win the Wisconsin Republican primary.